What is going on guys kingpin light here and i wanted to continue our hist or my history uh learning through videos and that sort of thing so i chose one from very popular i think it's got a, a bunch of millions of views on this one world's most murderous dictator pol pot it's a 10 minute video i, I guess covering his reign and, and his atrocities and everything else and this is a video by the infographics show so if you guys want I'm going to link the original video down below. And I do this for all of any song I react to or any video I react to. If you go down in the description, you're going to find the original video. Because I don't, I don't like just taking somebody's content and not letting people find it on their own, right? And I feel like I break up these videos with so much of my talking that some people would benefit just from watching it. You know what I mean? Without me commenting on it. Um, but yeah, we're going to go ahead and jump right in. Uh, I don't know much about this. Um, I remember the name from school, uh, but I don't think we went into, we didn't go very much into depth uh, into this topic. So I don't actually know very many details outside of what I've learned from you guys in the comments and and Vonda's music and that sort of thing. And then the quick history, the Kamai Empire. Uh, but I don't know a lot of the details of his dictatorship. So let's just jump right in. At the Chong Ek Memorial in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, you'll find a stupa a squat, tower-like structure used as a place of prayer and meditation by Buddhists. At a distance, this little building might seem like a good photo op, but if you get closer, you'll see a truly harrowing sight. Around 5,000 human skulls are... Don't need close captioning if it's in English. 5,000 human skulls in this... Alright, well, let me back up a little bit. Closer, you'll see a truly harrowing sight. Around 5,000 human skulls are stored inside. While this is horrific in its own right, 5,000 dead are the tip of the iceberg for what lays below in a mass grave known as the Killing Fields. And for oh, I have heard, I have actually heard the Killing Fields, but I don't know from where. Um, the term, I mean, I've heard the term, and I've heard about it. That, that's insane. So my question is, because they show the picture, they show it stored like in a display case. And it looked like it's maybe an active tower. So is this like a historical museum piece of sorts? Or was this just an artistic rendition? And what they really mean is that because so many people were killed there, their, their skulls are just kind of all over the place in that area. Is that what they mean? I don't know. Maybe we'll find out. Let's keep going. The iceberg for what lays below in a mass grave known as the Killing Fields. And for this, we have one man to thank, Pol Pot leader of the Khmer Rouge and orchestrator of the horrific Cambodian genocide. While he's rarely mentioned alongside other vicious dictators of the 20th century, like Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Benito Mussolini, and Chairman Mao, proportionally Pol Pot is as bad as any of them, often credited with murdering practically a quarter of his own country during his four-year reign from 1970. Jesus Christ. How is this not mentioned as much? And, and like he said, right, there's all of these dictators from this century. Of course, Hitler and Stalin, we all know about him. Chairman Mao, I don't actually know too much about Chairman Mao. Um, I, I honestly don't. Um, but I have heard of him. And then Pol Pot, I have heard of as well. But it does feel like there's less conversation around this. And I don't even, I can't even pinpoint where I heard Pol Pot from. Like, I generalized it in my head as I, I picked it up from school, but I don't even know if that's factual because I slept through most of school. I was, uh, I got like straight A's on tests, so I just slept through the classes. But I mean, very honestly, I picked up a lot of my own knowledge from watching like the History Channel or National Geographic or whatever, all these different sources. So I actually don't know if Pol Pot was mentioned in school for sure or not. Um, but the other thing is in four years, which is not a long time at all, for four years, or only four years, he uh, he got a quarter of his population murdered. That's insane. This is an insane... That's just insane. 75 to 1979, Pol Pot has left a legacy of torture, brutality, fear, and mass killings that left scars on the Cambodian psyche even today over 40 years after the worst of his terrible violence the man's cruel yeah 40 years after 40 years but what, what was the time 75 and 79 jesus christ that's i'm 25 now i was born in 96 
96 would have been uh, 3, so 7 would have been, eight. I'm so bad at backwards math. Uh, hold on, 96, 87, 17, what is it, like 17, 18 years, about 17 years before I was born, when this ended, that's insane, that's less time from when this happened to when I was born, it was a shorter amount of time than from when I was born to today, like that is really, really close. In Psyche even today, over 40 years after the worst of his terrible violence, the man's cruelty and ruthlessness in carrying out his communist agrarian vision was the stuff of legend, and for many in Cambodia, even the mere mention of his name is enough to send a chill down their spine. So for one of arguably the world's most murderous dictators, responsible for the senseless slaughter of over a million of his own citizens, it's worth asking the following questions. Who was this man, and how and why did he come to power? And what horrors did he unleash on the citizens he should have been protecting? Well, first of all, Pol Pot wasn't actually his real name. Pol Pot was born in 1925 as Salat Tsar in the small Cambodian village of Prexbov in the Kampong Tong. So he was Cambodian himself, which makes... Not that it would have made it any better if he was a, an invading dictator and, and having killed a quarter of the people. But it feels more wrong. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's not that it would have been better that he wasn't from Cambodia by any means, but, like, how do you how do you grow up in a certain country, know the people, know the culture, and actively seek to destroy it? Like, well, I guess we're going to find out what his reasoning was. There's no reason to do it, but there's always a reasoning from the other point of view, you know what I mean? Home province. He was the eighth of nine children. The Cambodia that Tsar was born into was once still under French colonial rule, which was naturally a point of contention between the Cambodian people and the powers that be over... Hold on, I got the sun like right in my eyes. There we go. Alright, so it was... So he grew up under France occupation uh, of Cambodia. ...in France, though Tsar himself was unlikely to have felt the ripples of this personally, having been born into a relatively well-off landowning farming family. His family owned 50 acres of rice paddy, which was over 10 times the national average at the time, so it was fair to say that he lived a pretty charmed life early on. So just how did this upper crust one percenter end up murdering a quarter of his own country? Salazar would make for a- Always the well-off people, huh? Maybe that's why. He was out of tune with like the day-to-day -day regular people of his country. Um, of course, this is, an, this is a much- bigger and more atrocious example of that but i mean on a lower scale right even the nicest dudes that grew up with money just are so out of touch from regular people they just they don't even understand the struggles that they deal with on a financial or on a daily level um which i'm sure didn't help with him going down this path though you, though again I say that, but you have to be a very specific, sick type of person to end up like this. I don't think it's so much the background. I think it's almost the chemistry of your brain, like there's something off. A terrible student, and his parents worried about his future. While not interested in education in the least, a young Tsar was immediately attracted to the revolutionary attitudes of Cambodian communists, especially those who sought independence from France. Salah Tsar began using the revolutionary pseudonym Pol Pot, short for the French phrase politique potentielle, or potential politics. In politics, he found what he believed to be his true calling. So much so, in fact, that he decided to invest all his time in revolutionary activities rather than his schooling. As a result, he failed his next wave of examinations and had his scholarship revoked by the government. He, re he was an idiot. Why would he name himself uh, after his his... Like, what would they be called, the French, the occupiers, I guess? Why, why would he change his name to be a reference to the occupier's language? That seems a little weird. You know what I mean? It's like if... if I don't want to pick a country because I feel like it's going to start something. But I will. So it's like if, if Russia invaded the U.S., right, and they occupied the U.S., and I changed my name to be some sort of Russian name to fight against them. You know what I mean? Like That just sounds really, really weird and strange. I mean, maybe maybe there's some reasoning and maybe it makes sense to other people. It makes no sense to me. Like, if I'm trying to kick some people out of my country, 
I'm not gonna use their names, their language. The hell? Returned to Phnom Penh in 1953 with a head full of dangerous ambitions. Oh. One sec. Right. Though it'd be another few decades before he could put the most nightmarish of them into practice. The same year Pot returned to his home country, Cambodia finally gained independence from French colonial rule after the people revolted against their European oppressors. This left a kind of power vacuum in the country that numerous political entities, Pol Pot and his communist allies included, would later attempt to fill. In the meantime, much like his fellow 20th century Asian dictator Chairman Mao, Pol Pot decided to pursue teaching while he kept his revolutionary plans on the back burner. He taught at Phnom Penh private schools between 1956 and Who gave this man a job to teach when he failed every single class he had? What the fuck? Ugh. Just a real question, why would he get a teaching job when he was proven not to be a good learner? Like what? What's going on here? 1963, specializing in history, geography, and French literature, and marrying his first wife, Kiyu Panari, in the interim. If Pol Pot had decided to settle down and invest himself fully in his teaching career, Cambodia would have been spared a lot of bloodshed and horror, but it's sadly not how this all played out. Pot spent his time helping to build up Cambodia's Communist Party on the side, serving as its secretary in 1960, and converting it to his particular brand of Marxist-Leninism. All right, I had to go get another beer and move the blinds a little bit so that it's not right in my face, but let's keep going. ...didn't take kindly to this kind of subversive activity, and began a crackdown on communist groups that forced Pol Pot and his allies to flee Phnom Penh and take refuge in the jungle. There, Pot encamped with a group of Viet Cong before beginning his quest to reform his scattered own group into the Khmer Rouge guerrilla army, a revolutionary insurgency movement who intended to pry... Okay, so it is pronounced Rouge. I was actually wondering that... Because there's rogue, so that's spelled G-U-E, so it is, I guess it is Rouge. I just didn't know if it had its own pronunciation, but, all right, so. Khmer Rouge Army was his way at the time, obviously it led to much more heinous actions, but at the time, the reasoning for him was taking back the land for his people, using, uh, and he was a heavily communist sort of guy, I guess, that was his ideology. Okay, well, let's keep going. ...into the Khmer Rouge guerrilla army, a revolutionary insurgency movement who intended to pry control of the country out of royal hands. As Pot grew his forces and began launching his revolution in 1968, it was clear that what he lacked in academic drive, he made up for in having an almost preternatural level of charisma and persuasion. One Khmer Rouge defector would later say, Pol Pot makes very powerful impressions on those who hear him for the first time. After that, they want to come back. Those who attend his seminars feel in Charismatic leader. Yep, all the starts of a dictator. I'm curious to see a picture of him. So after this, because this, uh, by the way, this is great quality. is amazing uh, presentation and music and all that. This is a great video. But um, I think this is the style that it's going to be in the whole time. So I am curious to look up what he looks like later. Uh, it doesn't really change anything. I'm just curious. I don't know if I've ever even seen a picture of him enlightened by his teaching, his explanations, and his vision. He's like a father to us. Much like another one of his contemporaries, Nazi leader Adolf Hitler, Pol Pot ran his political movement not unlike a cult, a group with a loose ideology congealed around a charismatic leader. Ultimately, mm. what ushered Pol Pot into power were the conditions of absolute chaos occurring in the late 60s and early 70s. In 1970, a brutal civil war broke out between the forces of General Lon Nol and the Khmer Rouge. General Null undertook a military coup while the country's ruler, Prince Nordam Sihanouk, was away on business, and the prince sided with the Khmer Rouge. And like almost all terrible events that occurred. Okay, so we had a coup from Lon Nol. Or maybe I'm I mistook what he said. So it sounds like there was a military coup, so the prince decided to back the Rouge army. Uh, who were fighting for the prince and the people at the time uh, as a communist sort of told just the way that they described it, but that's a perfect way to describe it. Um, and that's where we are right now, I think. Null undertook a military coup while the country's ruler, Prince Nordam Sihanouk, was away on business, and the prince sided with the Khmer Rouge. And like almost all terrible events that occurred in the 70s, then U.S. President Richard Nixon was involved, while a coalition of... Oh my god. When is Nixon not involved in some fucking horrible thing? That's... 
that's darkly hilarious that he was involved because uh hell we didn't even want him we kicked him out after that watergate thing so that occurred in the 70s then u.s president richard nixon was involved while a coalition of 70,000 U.S. and South Vietnamese troops marched into Cambodia to root out the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong presence, Nixon was mm. busy dropping 500,000 tons of bombs on the country over the next four years. It was a complete humanitarian nightmare for... So we went in there to help. I say we collectively as, as the U.S. We went in there to help root out the Vietnamese from you guys. Or, or those stern like... Hold on the North Vietnamese 70,000 70s, then U.S. President Richard Nixon was involved. While a coalition of 70,000 U.S. and South Vietnamese troops marched into Cambodia to root out the North Vietnamese... Right, okay. So, we were not necessarily there to help Cambodia, though we probably worded it as such. We were just there to fight back against the North Vietnamese, because we were helping out the South Vietnamese at the time. And we were rooting them out of the country... 70,000 well, combined troops, but that's still a good bit. And, Viet and then they dropped half a million tons of bombs over the next, what was it, six years or something? And you guys did mention that in the comments, that happening, that's just, that's crazy. Kong presence, Nixon was busy dropping 500,000 tons of bombs on the country over the next four years. I guess that's another good reason we got rid of him as a president as quick as we could. He was not a good guy. Not a good guy at all. But again, superpowers are known for this. So it's not just Nixon. It's been Russia. It's been China. And it's been the U.S. countless of times throughout history, our short history, where we just kind of throw our weights around for small against smaller countries. Uh, we got, of course, North Korea trying to go down that path. But they're like the, the little brother. You know what I mean? They're like, sure, you don't want to get stabbed by your little brother or anything but they're they're not really big boys yet they'll be big boys one day when that day comes hopefully they can't they don't start bombing everybody but right now they're little little kids you know what i mean so we're fine right there but you know the big superpower countries really throw their weight around and that's that's just been a common thing throughout history and not just even modern history i mean look back at like greek and mongols and and you know dynasties from china it's just it's been all throughout history uh, the British obviously did a whole lot of that when they were doing their globalization. Um, and unfortunately, that's just a, a bad side effect of human society thus far. Uh, I don't know what the answer is. I'm not gonna, I don't know what the answer is. It just, I hope it doesn't happen as much anymore. It was a complete humanitarian nightmare for all parties involved. In the meantime, the violence committed by General Nol, the South Vietnamese, and the United States was radicalizing more locals into the Khmer Rouge cause, swelling their armies massively. By the time the U.S. was finished brutalizing Cambodia with their bombing campaign, Pol Pot controlled three-quarters of what was left, and after a sustained shelling and forced starvation campaign over Phnom Penh left the capital defenseless, the Khmer forces stormed in and took absolute control. On April 17, 1975, Pol Pot became the de facto leader of Cambodia. Many thought the end of the Cambodian Civil War would usher in a period of stability for the country. So up until this point, there were some very major red flags by looking at the generalization. Because real life isn't as black and white or as easy as textbooks show, right? You got to think people live day to day. You know what I mean? So history, we can be like, well, how did nobody see Hitler rising to what he became or Pol Pot rising to what he became? But you got to think most people during that time had to go to work, wake up, brush their teeth, shower, go get groceries every day. Other politicians were worried about their own rise to power or sometimes they're just there for a job and they're focusing on their family. You know what I mean? Real life it isn't that easy. And while there might have been signs, you know what I mean? I don't think it's as easy to be able to tell where it's going to lead when you're in the moment. Um, but so far, there was big red flags uh, about his kind of come up. But there was at least some semblance of reasoning up until this point, right? Now, I'm going to put my own personal bias against communism out of this. He, he had his cause, right? He had a specific belief, political belief. He gathered people around him, 
that also believe that. And then all of these other things from the U.S., from the Vietnamese, um, from the coup that was happening, all of this stuff was making people say, hey, look, this leader th- feels like he knows what he want, or what he like he knows what he's doing to try and get us out of this. And so up until this point, this this doesn't make sense, right? Like up until this point, it, it doesn't seem random, but I'm waiting to see where it flips, like what the reasoning was, because so far I haven't even gotten a semblance of a clue on why he would do that. Unless he was at threat of being pulled out of power after all of these things went away. Uh, I'm not sure. Little did they know that the worst was yet to come. Pol Pot had been planning for decades, and at long last he had the power to actualize those plans. Like many infamous totalitarian dictators, he wasn't after power for its own sake. He had a vision for his perfect country, and anyone who didn't fit into that vision was destined to meet a grisly end. Pol Pot wanted to take Cambodia back to its roots as a proud nation of grassroots farmers and laborers. Under the rule of Pol Pot, the decadent ranks of the educated, professional, and urban were public enemy number one. It was these academics who would mm. meet the worst fates. One of Pol Pot's first insane actions was evacuating Cambodia's urban areas, including Phnom Penh, displacing and ruining the lives of millions. Professionals like doctors, lawyers, and civil servants were forced into re-education camps, stripped of their possessions, and made to work themselves to the bone in Cambodia's... Oh, that is so fucking weird. This is why I don't understand communism. Like, I understand it on paper. I get why people would want to go down that path. But this sort of reasoning is the reason that communism will never work and communism is nowhere near the superpower democracy is right now and that's because when you take away the incentive to do better what's the point you know what i mean like what's the point like i'm not gonna work twice as hard as my neighbor to make the same thing i'm just gonna take it easy like meaning if i can do the job my neighbor does with half the the effort that he takes why the hell am i gonna put twice the effort to get the same thing back i'm just gonna do half the effort and then go home and chill the other half of the day you know what i mean like there's no incentive why do it why i don't care and, and it doesn't even help them out that's the thing right it's not that you're because there's always got to be human leadership there's always going to be greed involved at the top right so all of this extra effort that you're putting in isn't even helping out the people in your local community it's going to be helping out the people in the in the big government basically but anyway i got way sidetracked all of the major countries right now a lot of the reason they're superpowers is because they were able to industrialize and have higher education and higher uh, production value goods and materials to export right what he's talking about is taking away their the leverage they have on the rest of the world and going back to just an agricultural country and i don't understand i don't understand the reasoning he's undermining his own power by lowering the education and workload of his own people so that in itself already doesn't even make sense before we even get to the the atrocities you know what i mean his fields and rice paddies if you dared to complain about the backbreaking work then you'd likely find yourself in one of the Khmer rouge's infamous detention centers being tortured until you either complied mm. or died. One particular detention center, the S-21, a former high school turned into a dystopian torture chamber, had only 23 survivors out of its 18,000 known prisoners. Jesus Christ. The dystopian torture chamber had only 23 survivors out of its 18... 18,000 people and 23 survived in one detention center. Yeah. I, I don't know why this isn't talked about more. I mean, obviously, to you guys being in Cambodia, you all know about it. You've all heard about it. It's recent history, right? But it, what I mean is I don't know why it's not talked as much about on a global scale. Um, it... Thousand known prisoners. The brutality in these institutions under Pol Pot was so great that they had official torture manuals dictating methods of interrogation with choice excerpts like, our experience in the past has been that our interrogators for the most part tended to fall on the torture side.
However, we must nevertheless strive to do politics to get them always and absolutely to confess to us. Only once have we pressured them politically. Only when we have put them in a corner politically and have gotten them to confess will torture become productive. Pol Pot's minions often found that torture was extremely productive. They would get political, get a confession out of them, and then torture them? I don't, I don't understand. I mean, I understand that they're doing sick actions for the sake of being sick people, but what is their reasoning in their head? Like, wouldn't you torture somebody and then, and then get a confession out of them? Why would you get... What the hell? ...become productive. Pol Pot's minions often found that torture was extremely productive. Pot instituted a level of totalitarian control that made the dystopian world of George Orwell's 1984 look like a daycare in comparison. Among the things outlined by Pol's Khmer Rouge regime were private property, jewelry, money, religion, gambling, and most reading material. What? I mean, I knew already, like, the arts and everything were, were outlawed, which was mind-blowing to me that that would even be a thing. Um... But now, private property, jewelry, money, religion, gambling, reading material. I mean, that's literally a very large portion of life. You know what I mean? So what they wanted was a country of slaves that didn't argue back at all. And if you argued, you were tortured and killed. Which is even a step above what I already knew. Like, I knew they didn't want educated and artistic people and I assumed it was to get rid of the culture so that you could better subjugate the people that you were ruling over uh, but now it's sounding like they literally just wanted a country of slaves because that that's legitimately what it sounds like that's unhinged material if you defied these laws you'd once again either be tortured shot or both and even if you weren't personally executed by the Khmer forces, that didn't mean you were out of the woods. The horrific mismanagement of resources under Pol Pot led to widespread famine, leading countless Cambodian citizens to die from malnutrition. Mm. Their bodies were dumped into mass graves in the same so-called killing fields, with the body count ratcheting up to astronomical numbers. Pol Pot's supervillain-level dictatorship antics didn't end with all the horrific mass murder, torture, and starvation. He committed many acts that were as petty as they were strange and sadistic. The country was renamed Democratic Kampuchea, despite... Why? Well, I guess let me ask that, because there might be a reason behind it. I get the Democratic, which <laughs> is absolutely the opposite of what was going on here. So, like a sick joke he made? Oh, we're Democratic. Anyway, the Kampuchea, what is that? Um... They might say it here, but they don't. Let me know what that is, because maybe that means something that I'm not aware of. ...were strange and sadistic. The country was renamed Democratic Kampuchea, despite democracy playing no real role in the government. There were strict rules imposed on sexual relations, the clothing you could wear, and even the words you could use, in what feels like almost a direct tribute to Orwell's dystopian masterwork. In one particularly insane act, the country's rice fields were forcibly realigned in order to resemble the Khmer Rouge's checkerboard pattern coat of arms. Holy shit, this guy is... Yeah, this guy's insane. I mean, on top of being a uh, malicious POS, I don't know if I'm allowed... I keep forgetting if I'm allowed to cuss or not, but anyway, POS, he... Uh... He sounds insane. Like, and when I say insane, I don't mean like, like evil, because he is evil. But I'm saying evil and insane. Like he's, it's not making sense. He's really gonna. I guess I don't see the way he, these people like see the world, right? Like, even if you were to rule a country, the resources of the country are your resources now, right? Including the lives of your people. Uh, their time, their energy, right? That's all part of your resources that you need to manage if you're trying to create uh, any sort of output out into the world, right? And I don't understand why he would allocate so many hours to switch it just to match his coat of arms. Like the he... Orwell's dystopian masterwork. In one particularly insane act, 
The country's rice fields were forcibly realigned in order to resemble the Khmer Rouge's checkerboard pattern coat of arms. In spite of these cartoonishly weird decisions, you have to remember that Pol Pot was a truly horrific monster. Under his command, children would be ripped from their homes and forced into mandatory military service by the Khmer Rouge, creating an army of obedient soldiers who carried out the will of their murderous dictator on pain of death. Men, women, and children were all horrifically victimized under one man's vision of a classless utopia gone awry, with anyone daring to speak out meeting a brutal end. In 1979, a large detachment of Vietnamese troops stormed Cambodia and captured Phnom Penh, forcing the power-mad dictator back into the jungle with his Khmer Rouge guerrilla army. There, with political support from the US and China, Pol Pot continued military operations for the next 10 years. The movement would finally totally collapse in the late 90s. Hold oh, uh, we... Us in China helped Pol Pot for 10 years. This is, again, something else that I don't know. What did we get? What did the US and China gain from this? Like, I really don't understand. Oh, man, this is a lot heavier. Well, I knew it was heavy. This is a lot more... Uh, more pieces to the puzzle than what I originally thought going into this. Um, I didn't know that there was so much outside help and so much like uh, oddness, I guess, to his reign on top of the evilness of it, you know? Political support from the US and China, Pol Pot continued military operations for the next 10 years. The movement would finally totally collapse in the late 90s, following a ceasefire in 1991, and in 1997, a Khmer Rouge splinter cell would capture Pol Pot and place him under house arrest until he died of natural causes at age 72. Ready for more on some of the most Hold on, when, when did he die? The movement would finally totally collapse in the late 90s, following a ceasefire in 1991, and in 1997, a Khmer Rouge splinter cell would capture Pol Pot and place him under house arrest until he died of natural causes at age 72. When did he die then? So he, was he born, if they said in 25, and he died in 72, he died in 92? No, that doesn't make sense. Oh, was that date right there when he died? Causes at age 70. Hold on. Rupture wait. used as a place of prayer and meditation by Buddha. Oh, in a mass grave known as the Killing Fields. And for this, we had name. Pol Pot was born in 1920. 1925, and he died at the age of 72, they said. I'll double check, but... So he died in 1997. Yeah, the date that they showed at the very end. So he was alive when I was born. And a year after I was born. That's crazy. This whole thing is crazy. But honestly, this makes me want to just... Like, I'm more... I'm really interested in a lot more details from this. This was like a good overview. And now I need... And I want to go and learn more about like specific eras and and things that were going on, uh, the political climate of the time too. I, I want to get to the bottom of what the at least the official reason that the U.S. helped Pol Pot for ten years in the jungle. Like I'm sure it's not a good reason. There's nothing that would be good about helping him out. But like, he was communist first of all, and I thought the U.S. has always been like. We will do anything to stop communism, including work with drug traffickers, because they don't like communists either. Like, I, I don't understand. I really don't get a lot of this. Um, but that was really interesting, um, really horrific, and just crazy that it's not something that we learn about, at least in the U.S. very often. Or in detail, I'll say, because I may have picked it up from school, like I said, but... Anyway, guys, that was a really long video. Um, if you guys like that, like, subscribe, comment. Uh, let me know more facts. I, I've read every single one that you guys put on the last Kamai Empire video that I made. Uh, the history of. And uh, I love learning from you guys. So, anyway, I'll catch you guys in the next one.